Well, thank you for coming tonight. The devil told me all day nobody would come. But he don't tell the truth, does he? <laughs> so I don't know why we listen to him. But thanks for coming back if you were here last time. And it's good to see you tonight. So we're into the second of three talks from the book of Daniel. I've called these talks Living a Life Without Compromise in Today's PC Society. I think really very uh, exciting stuff is basic stuff, but I think we need the basic stuff from time to time. Um, I mean, Glennis was preaching years ago at Eve Lane, and I've apologised to one of the elders there that, uh, you know, didn't feel that uh, what she'd given was good enough. And he says, Glennis, sometimes it's lovely to have beans on toast. You don't always need to have a steak. So if this is just beans on toast, it'll be the basic. It, it may teach some of you that are young in the faith some of the fundamental stuff, and it'll remind all of us of how we should be living as God's people. So I'll do a brief recap. I'll allow Glennis out recaps. We need to do a recap. Uh, last time, to set the scene to the talks, we took a look at the historical background. Thank you for hanging in with me, because it, it wasn't that easy. I'm glad the Lord gave us a bit of humor at the end. Uh, that wasn't intended, but uh, it really helped, didn't it, at the end? Well, I thought it did anyway. And last week, last fortnight, we, we, two weeks ago, we briefly traced how long... Start again. We briefly traced that uh, long ago, that's what I meant to say, God chose one man, Abraham, and promised that through him and his seed, all the families of the earth would be blessed. That's where it all began as far as we are concerned. He was the first believer, really, um, of any significance that uh, we connect with in the Scripture. That one man became a family, and the family became a nation, and eventually the nation went down to Egypt at the time of Joseph, you'll remember, where we remained for 400 years. And this was followed by a period of the judges, men whom God raised up to deliver the nation from successive uh, would-be conquerors. Uh, then came the period of the kings. The first king was Saul, the people's choice, who was followed in turn by David, who was God's choice, and then Solomon and Rehoboam. And all of these ruled over a united kingdom of the 12 tribes. Now, shortly after Rehoboam's reign began, the nation split into two. In the north was the kingdom of Israel, sometimes in Scripture called Ephraim. So if you read Ephraim in the Bible, it means the north kingdom of Israel. And in the south, the kingdom of Judah. The northern kingdom was composed of ten tribes, and its capital was Samaria. I nearly thought of a joke then. I will stop and... The largest woman in the Bible? Come on. I want somebody to tell me the largest woman in the Bible. Come on, Ken. The woman of some area. Oh, never mind. That's all you're getting tonight. <laughs> oh, dear. I've lost my place now, my notes. It serves me right. Um... And, and the southern kingdom, that was the northern kingdom, Samaria. The southern kingdom was composed of two tribes, and its capital was Jerusalem. And eventually God moved to judge the nation against the apostasy. That was the turning away from God to worship other gods that he'd often spoken of through his prophets that he'd raised up. The northern kingdoms were dealt with first through the mighty Assyrian army, about 722 years before Christ and Samaria fell. The southern kingdoms were dealt with next, approximately 100 years later, and over the horizon came uh, Nebuchadnezzar, and over the next 23 years in four successive stages, he transported all the people of Judea here, uh, to his native Babylon. However, among the exiles to Babylon, there were remained a, a very small number of individuals. Oh, I said last week the Bible identifies as the remnant. That's always a small group of faithful people. Um, and, and they continue to serve God truth, truthfully and faithfully and honor his word throughout the 70 long years of exile. 
And that small group was represented by Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. As you can read in Daniel chapter 1 and verse 6. Now, there may be some of you thinking tonight, well, that's okay, that's a bit of Jewish history. Well, what's that got to do with us in essentially this cold Thursday night as we gather? Well, we read in 1 Corinthians, uh, the book of 1 Corinthians and uh, chapter 10, um, something that we need to take notice of. But what happened to these people many generations ago actually concerns us as God's people in our day and age. And he says in chapter 10, verse 11, these things, all the stuff we read in the Bible, the history of Israel, all the stuff I just had a quick run through and much more, these things happened to them as examples and were written down as warnings for us on whom the culmination of the ages has come. So we have flesh and blood examples, if you like, from the past of what we're taught in the New Testament of how to live and what we should do. I know we live under different covenants, but I need to emphasize tonight, God never changes and his truth never changes. The covenant, the terms of the covenant may be different, but God never changes and his truth never changes. And so as he dealt with them, we can take that as an example of how God is and how he views sin, and how he views lots of things. They are the first God's believing people, really. And uh, I think uh, in the book of Acts, uh, Peter, or whoever, I can't think, it's off the top of my head, refers to these people as a church in the wilderness. They were the first believers, as we understand it, the church in the wilderness. So what happened to them, we ought to read and take note of it and learn from it according to what the Scripture says. So that's why it's applicable to us here tonight. So we'll start with Nebuchadnezzar's expedition against Jerusalem. The first two verses of Daniel 1 tell us about that. And I, I want to emphasize tonight, friends, that we're, we're not reading a story. You must not tell me a story. We, we're dealing with history, with events that really took place. And it's uh, in 605 BC uh, where it all took place. And from Babylon comes Nebuchadnezzar, who had just become king of Babylon in the same year. And he lay siege on Jerusalem. He besieged Jerusalem. He defeated it, he entered it, and he, he took off to Babylon just what and whom he wanted. However, he didn't take the king. I think the king was a bit of a washout, as we'd say today. Uh, he, he left Jehoiakim, who was ruling at the time, as a puppet for the next eight years. I don't think he saw him as any threat. So he left him reigning there, but he, he, took, he was creaming off the assets, if you like, moving what he wanted and who he wanted. And Nebuchadnezzar takes to Babylon a number of captives and a large part of the temple treasures. treasures. The city remains intact, but the temple is spoiled, ruined, pulled down. And I want to emphasize tonight, the first principle to always remember, this was no accident. No accident. It was the Lord's doing. You see, we need to get away from our Father Christmas sort of idea of God. We've all got it, you know, and that it's all about us really and him blessing us and he sits in the sky and he just loves everybody and he wants to bless everybody. There's another side to God. And of course you see this in the Old Testament and sometimes you can't marry it up, can you, in your mind? You think, oh, he was so severe. He can be severe, friends, and he'll prove to be severe again in the last times when Jesus returns again. That the unrepentant sinners of this world will know something of the severity of God. Thank God we know of his goodness tonight. But there's another side to him. And so we can see this from the Old Testament scriptures. And all that was happening was happening for a purpose, for a real purpose. Um, it, was, it was the Lord's doing. Now that's a bit hard for some folks to swallow today because they don't believe God does naughty things. Well, what we appear to th think are bad things. But we have to believe that all things proceed from him in the end. I know he's not the author of sin. But, but uh, all things ultimately proceed from him, the good and the bad, according to the scripture. But of course, we don't get that taught very often today. And some people wouldn't accept that, uh, who, who, whose doctrine doesn't fit neatly into, into what I'm saying. But it was the Lord's doing. For 
too long the Jews had trusted in the temple and not in the Lord whom they claimed to worship there. Um, in other words, like many religious people of today, they had a superficial outward religion that lacked any true reality. They went through their religious motions, you know, and it hardly touched the rest of their lives. And despite the warnings of the prophets, uh, you know, they had believed that the very existence of the temple would guarantee them immunity from any threatened invasion. And believing this, a nation had continued on in its sin and its disobedience. The idea was, as long as the temple's there, God's still with us. And we're okay, really, in spite of what he's saying through one or two crackpot prophets. We're not sure about them. But the idolatry and the immorality and the injustice had gone on unabated, just as is happening today in our day and age. The lying and the stealing increased without restraint. And they were sure, however they lived. What's he making that noise for us to? I've got a bad chest. Can you hear it? <laughs> if Glennis was up here, it would be ten times worse. Don't worry, David. It's only me lighting in the proceedings. He's trying all his wires now. Um, but everything had gone on as if, as if, you know, God was just talking to himself, basically. They were turning a deaf ear. You know, just, just like we used to say to our kids, we might as well talk to ourselves. You know, but in the end, you have to get through, don't you? And God had to get through. And he got through. He was behind all this that happened. But they were quite sure the temple would save them. But it hadn't, friends. And now it was in ruins. And a pagan king was carrying his treasures into the house of his God and into, into his treasury. And by these events, God demonstrated that he will not tolerate sin, whatever people may think. That was true under the old covenant. It's true under the new friends. But it's not popular teaching today, of course. That's why I think I'm talking about it tonight. Um, you know, God would have turned his anger away from these people that were his if they'd turned to him re in repentance, but they constantly refused and instead trusted in religion. There's countless thousands are today. But you and I know tonight, because we're part of the faithful few, the trusting in religion, trusting in the temple, is no substitute for trusting in the true and living God. It isn't the same thing at all, as millions in this world one day will find out to their eternal regret. Some will have such a shock. With, and I, I think that they'll, you know, they'll say, Lord, Lord, we've done this in your name, that in your name, and many wonderful things in your name. We've always gone to church, Lord. We've always believed in you. We knew all the latest songs. And he's saying, no, I never knew you. I never knew you. You can get Pentecostal religion, you know. I'm convinced I've met one or two with Pentecostal religion. Something that's just outward. That's never really changed their lives thoroughly. God rules tonight, friends. God rules whether places of worship exist or not. They're only bricks and mortar, even the finest of them. And some of the parts of the earth today where the church is most effective and most strong lay little score on buildings. Do you realize that? We have great emphasis on buildings. It's, it's, it's success in our eyes, isn't it? You know, we all cart off to Eve Lane because they've got the best building around here when we need enough to get enough people in for a wedding or a funeral. Um, you know, and, and, and it's nice to have somewhere nice to meet, isn't it? But the emphasis has changed. I, I was saying to Glennis, I mean, I was, I was not, uh, I'm not old enough to remember this, but they have told me the early Pentecostals, you know, they had no buildings, had they? E Eve, Eve Lane, they met over, a, what was it? A bakery. You know, uh, well, it, must been, it must have been like Tommy Tucker's on the morning, and he, he went in on the night to pray the lovely smell of the wafting up. They had to climb up outwards, outside steps to get in, whatever the weather, you know, what, and whatever your age. And buildings it didn't matter much because they were hungering after God. Now we've got our fine buildings and we can hardly get anybody to come to them uh, with, all, with all the comforts that we've got. And, and we need to realise this, friends. I go on about this building. Some of you love it, I don't. Uh, but that's beside the point. We, uh, but Steve always says, we shan't be there long, Dad. Because he's got his eye on the bigger picture. This will do for a youth hall one day, perhaps, or something else. But, you know, when we're having to meet somewhere bigger to accommodate the people. And there we go, you know. It's only the lack of the acoustics, our mind, really, in the open plan. 
you know, when you're preaching and you're out to watching bullpens. And if anything happens down there, you lose half your congregation. If anything happens down there, you lose the other half. Have you ever noticed how all the heads go? <laughs> and you're standing in the middle. I've got nothing to say about it and, and the debt. I hate the debt because we could release so much of the money, couldn't we, to the Lord's work if we hadn't got it. But, friends, let's get our eyes on the real thing tonight. I need to, as well as you. You know, it ain't just this building. You know, as, as, as much as you might love it or as much as you might agree with me that we could sort of, you know, improve it a bit. It, it, nevertheless, you know, uh, it, it's the real church, it's the believers, isn't it, that really really count and this is something that god was having to teach his first church all these years ago you see um god rules as i've said he rules whether there are places of worship or not so we mustn't take refuge in buildings take refuge in the god of our father's friends that trusted him enough to put up the buildings uh, for his praise and glory and, and to preach the word of God. They're just meeting houses, really. But of course, they were really committed. Don't you ever think that? You think, who paid for this? Who put this up generations ago? A great company of believers that were sold out for God. But now they're just memorials to the past, sadly, many of them. But their God, our forefathers' God, is our God. And he remains constant through all the changing scenes of life and as i said last time he will always preserve a witness to his truth even if it's down to small figures i was talking to ken and betty before the meeting i must stop this because i must remember i've got to finish mind you i've got quarter past nine haven't i now do i have to think again on the weekend i'm going to change the clocks so it'll be an hour less in bed so i'm talking about time so just a little reminder is it next week or the week after that's you talking in the car, Glenn, about putting the clock back. Right, where am I? Right. <laughs> so the Bible is quite clear regarding Nebuchadnezzar. The Lord gave him victory over King Jehoiakim of Judah. I know what I was going to say about the Baptist. One time I got sidetracked with time. There was a time when Robert Street Baptist, as you know, in Gornal, my friend Winston used to go there and I used to work with him. And I see him going to church with his granddad. And I found out years later, their membership was down to one at the time I first knew him. And Miss Jews, she was the only one. She didn't turn up, they couldn't have communion. Because they don't allow communion only for baptized members. So if she didn't turn up, there was no communion. And he said, many occasions, Dave, I played the organ and my granddad's preached to an empty church. There hasn't been a soul there. But God's rewired his work again. If you go down that way on your way home on a Sunday night, look at the cars outside now. I mean, you know, you'd think it ought to be closed, naturally speaking, but God has a wonderful way of reviving his work. He does. And he's behind it all and he's on the throne, friends. We have to believe this. And the Bible's quite clear regarding Nebuchadnezzar. The Lord gave him, he was an unbeliever at the time, victory over King Jehoiakim of Judah, which teaches us that God is perfectly in control of history, and he's well able to keep his promises, whether they are promises of judgment or of blessing. The conquered city, the spoiled temple, the transported treasures, the weeping captives, all of this were all God's doing and for the furtherance of his purposes. And the experience of the people at that time was defeat, ruin and destruction. But he remained the undefeated God working in it and through it all. He's always got the big picture in view, friends, and he knows what he's doing. So let's have a look at Daniel and his three companions. We'll, re we'll show this up, Dave, I think. Uh, Daniel uh, chapter 1, just the first three verses. It says, uh, In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord delivered Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand, along with some of the articles from the temple of God. These he carried off to the temple of his God in Babylonia and put the treasure house of, and put in the treasure house of his God. So that, that's, that's just confirmed what I've just said. And then we're, we're introduced to these, these characters, um, you know, amongst, sorry, I, I should have put verse 6, um, <laughs> among them... 
uh, were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah. And uh, then he tells you what happened to them, which I'm going to tell you now. So we're introduced to these main characters of the book of Daniel. I said last time, in all probability, they were only teenagers. They were all only teenagers. Now, Nebuchadnezzar had a brilliant mind. And he was far too clever to think the best way to deal with the prisoners of war was to crush them and put them under the jack boot. Pharaoh would try that generations before, hadn't he? You know, he was acting in that way. And whenever this happens in history, uh, it teaches us that people eventually revolt, don't they? Hence the saying, the peasants are revolting. The peasants have always been revolting, haven't they? <laughs> but the peasants do revolt. You, you try to keep, suppress people, they would always revolt, in church or out of church or anywhere. Now, Nebuchadnezzar knew, as Babylon at that time was conquering the world, that eventually there would be more conquered people than the indigenous population. Say no more. So we hit on this cunning plan. It was a better than any cunning plan that Baldrick ever came up with in Blackadder. It really was. His cunning plan was to integrate as many of the prisoners as possible into the Babylonian civil service. In this way, the ever-increasing dominions would be ruled over by the integrated people. And if any rebellion arose, they'd be the ones to deal with it. It really was a cunning plan. Can you imagine how clever this scheme was? Suppose a family were protesting and potentially rebelling, and they came to the civil authorities with their complaint. In all probability in time, they would be dealt with by one of their own sons or nephews, or the sons of, or nephews of one of their neighbours or their friends. It was a very clever plan, wasn't it? It didn't need tens of thousands of soldiers to implement and keep in place. And they weren't forever sitting on a time bomb, because that integrated the people. And that, that, they'd educated them, and they now got a good job in, in Babylon. And that's how they prospered. And so was these four men were forcibly enlisted, selected to embark upon a comprehensive program of re-education, where particular importance was laid upon a thorough grounding in the language and literature of the Babylonians. And in addition to that, uh, for the next three years, that their lives were filled with lessons in mathematics, in science, navigation, politics, history, and geog geography. In fact, the whole spe spectrum of Babylon, Babylonian learning was going to be installed into these young minds. They were literally reprogrammed, literally reprogrammed. And each of the names were changed from what they, they were to Babylonian names. Now, you know that names in the Bible are very significant. These lads' original names were significant. Daniel meant God has judged. Hananiah meant Jehovah has been gracious. Mishael meant who is like God. And Azariah meant Jehovah has helped. And in the place of these godly names, they were given names that spoke of Babylon and their pagan deities. So can you imagine the scene tonight? These, these lads are taken forcibly from their homes and families, told to forget their God, intensely re-educated into pagan culture. They were the boys fair. No doubt uh, some raised like them would think it was their lucky day. Once it dawned on them, they weren't going to be slaves. Have you ever thought about it? No doubt some were tired of village life and family values and probably more of the godly values. And look forward to this free education, the best of food, the pick of the young women, and so forth. You know, it'd be like going to the big city, throwing off all the restraint. But not these four. That's the point, not these four. Again, as I said earlier, anything of real value spiritually has to be a heart matter. A heart matter. And what you really believe doesn't easily change with the changing circumstances of life. It doesn't, friends. It's amazing, that is. I've lived long enough to see this. Once you what our old pastor used to call, once you're rooted and grounded in the things of God, you're not easily shaken, whatever happens to you. And it was with these lads. And, and I want to ask you all tonight, including myself, what, uh, what do we really believe and why are we really here? And only God and ourselves can know the answer to that question. But part of the work of the ministry is to challenge people, friends. That's why I'm glad our ministry is getting more and more challenging. Hebrews 4 verse 12 says, The word of God is active and alive, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. 
It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. The word of God isn't a dead word, friends, or an ineffective word. It's got life in it. It's got life in it. And because it's got life in it, it produces life. It produces effects. There's something about the truth, as God has revealed it, that connects it to God as a source of all life and power. You know, God loves his word, and we should love his word as he loves it. He's partial to his word. He honors his word with his presence and his power. So I'd say to all of you tonight, uh, and, and to me included, I think the secret of a good, successful Christian life is to stay close to the revealed word of God. Not to lean to our own understanding, certainly not to follow the counsel of the ungodly, but lean closely to the revealed word of God. But, and it's a big but, but, and it's a big but, it must pierce us. Did you notice? It says it pierces us. It gets through to us, uh, to the very most part uh, uh, of us. And if we're to truly grow spiritually, it has to do that, friends. It has to hit us. It has to pierce us. It has to get through. So if ever you go from the house of God uncomfortable about the ministry, don't try and shrug it off. Ask yourself some honest questions as to why you feel uncomfortable. That's what we've done, some of us, over the years since we've been teenagers. We've sat under strong ministry, and, and, and we've listened to it, and sometimes it's put us straight. But, you know, instead of thinking that, oh, like him, I ain't going there to hear him again. We've been there the next meeting drinking some more. And our lives have come into line with Scripture and with God. And I think that's a big secret, friends. You know, it's possible. In fact, we pray, don't we? That God will speak to people by his spirit through his word upon issues that they need to address. And responding positively is the way to spiritual progress, friends. We're looking for responses. Responding negatively uh, is the way to spiritual declension. How many do we know tonight who used to come here to worship and class themselves as members? And they're sat at home tonight without any interest, spiritually ailing, because they, when they did come, they either failed to hear the challenge of the Word of God, or if they did hear it, they shrugged it off and refused to change. There's many, I fear, if we wouldn't start thinking about them and praying for them. Sometimes we do on a Friday night, and the list is endless. But it's so important, friends, that, that's why... I, you know, when I told everybody to be quiet and sit down, and I've perhaps said it more than once, but not many times, when, when everyone was walking around like this marketplace, and no one, we couldn't get attention. It wasn't, I didn't, it wasn't me being bad sent, but honestly, I was thinking people aren't getting the word of God. You know, they're distracted from scripture. They need to hear it. They need to take it to heart. That, that they need to wait up and, uh, and to act upon it. And that's why we need to give it our uh, attention. And I'm, I'm glad things are better now. There's a real good attention to the Word of God these days. So let's move on to the stand of Daniel and his three companions. Verses 8 to 16. It's a bit, a bit uh, small, this is. But Daniel resolved not to defile himself with the royal food and wine. And he asked the chief official for permission not to defile himself in this way. Now God had caused the officials to show favor and sympathy to Daniel. But the official told Daniel, I'm afraid of my lord, the king, who was assigned to you for your food and drink. Why should he see you looking worse than the other young men of your age? They are young men. The king would then have my head because of you. And then, of course, Daniel persuades him. You know, he says, well, you know, let's test it out. Let's see what happens. Don't worry about it. God, God's in all of this. So, so we read of this amazing stand for God that these four lads took with Daniel as their leader and their spokesman. And before I mention this, let me remind you once more why the Jews were in this place at all, in this place of captivity. I don't want to bore you, but the whole nation was spiritually low and therefore morally low. The two were always connected. That's why our world's in a mess. The crying sin had become idolatry, all the things in the place of God. The exile was punishment for all the nation's sins in general, but for idolatry in particular, and they were to remain in Babylon until it had finished, they had finished with it forever. And whatever mistakes the Jews fell into in their post-exile period, idolatry, surprising, wasn't one of them. Oh, Steve's not in tonight, is he? I always have to check with Steve after that I've said right when it comes to things Jewish. Uh, so uh, 
I can't guarantee him tonight. But I think it's true to say that uh, whatever things they fell into in their post-exile period, uh, idolatry wasn't one of them. The exile apparently cured them of that for good. But at the time of the exile, idolatry was a feature of their national life. And what marked out the few, the godly remnant, from all the others were the adamant refusal to have anything to do with it. No compromise. So imagine these four friends starting their re-education program. They're told instead of preparing their own food, they are to be fed at the raw table. And if you were taking note, uh, as we read uh, the scriptures, you'll remember, uh, I don't think I've got on to it, whether, yes, where they refused. They did. I think I got down to a point where they refused. Now the reason they turned down the royal food was not because of the Jewish food laws that they'd been raised on. Uh, they could have at least had the wine, as there was no Jewish law forbade that. The reason for their refusal of everything was that the food from the king's table had been offered to idols before it was served. That was the reason. Every ba Babylonian kingly meal began with an act of pagan worship. It must have been a small one, because the food had gone cold. Gone cold. The way some folks say grace, I think, hurry up, it'll be cold. <laughs> I'm hungry. You know, tell the people hungry, and I tell them they pray before the food. But, um, you know, um, before anything was eaten or drinking, it was dedicated to a certain pagan deity. And those who ate the food were reckoned to have participated in those pagan rites. And it was precisely because they refused to compromise with such idolatry, the four lads had a place among the godly remnant. They, they could see clearly, in other words. They could see the implications, and so they stood alone. Now, of course, if Daniel was here today, most Christians would think him a bit extreme, wouldn't they? You know, a bit intense, isn't it, this Daniel? A bit intense. They'd say, well, my, such a fuss, I was such a small thing as that. You, you're going to risk losing your head. Put your scruples to one side, you know, just, just think what influence you'll have eventually in the government. You might even get to a high position. Play your cards right, lad. That's, that's how lots of... Christians today would think, be sensible, don't yeah. be like that. The kind of thing you see every day, isn't it? You know, in the world of entertainment and sport, sometimes a godly person stands out for Christian principle. And we rejoice, don't we? You think, oh, that's marvellous. But more often or not, people who profess to be the Lord's people are seen to compromise. It's when you stand for God and you stand out for God that the best witness is made. And in spite of all the consideration that might have passed through his mind or been suggested to him by others, we read in verse uh, 8 of chapter 1, But Daniel made up his mind not to defile himself by eating the food and wine given to them by the king. And so there's a lesson for us, friends. Sadly today, I think uh, Christians rarely purpose anything of spiritual significance. That's why we don't grow and develop and revival tariffs, friends. They never for one moment consider a way of life that may cost them something or cause them to be out of favour with others. Sometimes you've got to be out of favour with others to please the Lord. If I'd have followed my parents and their viewers, I wouldn't have been here tonight. And I had good parents. They certainly didn't want me to become a Pentecostal. Not be as radical as this, you know. Going to the temple was all right. But giving my life to the true and living God was something else. You know, today, friends, we've become very self-centred. The whole church has. It's all about me, me, me. But it's decent friends. It's all about God, really. And uh, the, the, the blessings that come to us are really indirectly, aren't they? We don't seek after things for ourselves. Seek as great, just great things for yourself. Seek them, not the Bible says. No, we seek God. And the great things and the blessings come to us as uh, an outcome. I'll give you a scripture from the New Testament that especially sprang to mind this morning as I was preparing this talk. It's in the book of James, and he's writing to professing believers. And how would you like it if Pastor Steve talked to you like this? This is what he said to them. You adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world is hatred toward God? Anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. That's James 4.4. 4. So James is talking about the godless world system that we find ourselves living among and which, in point of fact, we don't belong to if we're real believers. And the Bible teaches we're in the world, we used to say it a lot of years ago, haven't we, but not of it. 
And God takes a dim view of those who are fraternizing with the enemy, because that's what James was talking about. In fact, he calls it adultery. I'm going to make a st strong statement now, friends. I don't know how many more times the Lord will allow me to preach, because sometimes when I, I'm forgetting my lines in the day, I think I don't know how I'll preach at night. <laughs> but it helps me a bit of, at the moment. It helps me a lot, actually. But uh, just remember this, if it might be one of the last, last times I ever preach. I honestly believe the trouble with the church today has got lots of troubles, but it's full of spiritual adultery. That's what it's full of, spiritual adultery. When believers should be intimate, with, with intimate communion with God in prayer and being taught his word and in fellowship with his people, where are they? Anybody's guess. They're in bed with someone or something else. We all know the implication, don't we? They're not faithful to God. They want God, or they want him there, like you want the wife at home and your shirt signed and your dinner on the table, but you're off with your lovers. But that's, that's what James is saying here. No single heartedness, no complete devotion to God. I can mention a few things now, but I've learned over the years just to preach the word of God and allow the Holy Spirit to apply the details, the details of it to our lives. I'm really sorry, friends. It's, it's my medication, and I had an awful night last night, and I'm finding it difficult to get my words out tonight. Uh, but we need to form our own spiritual convictions and, and not adopt other people's. Talking about legalism last week, that's, that's where legalism comes in, where, where we've got other people's opinions, and they've made a rule book, and everybody that joins the church has got to abide by that, plus the Bible. You know what I'm saying? We have to form our own spiritual convictions as the Holy Spirit applies the truth of the Word to our lives, and we let it pierce us and make a difference in our lives. So the outcome of the stand of Daniel and his three companions I'm not going to read it to you because the time's going. But the outcome is reco recorded for us in verses 17 to 21. They looked healthier and better nourished than the others that had sat at the king's table. And God gave them knowledge and understanding of all kinds of literature and learning. And Daniel himself was given understanding of visions and dreams of all kinds. And eventually, as most of you know, this was used by God to begin the process that eventually led to Nebuchadnezzar himself becoming a believer. That's the end of the story. I don't think I'll get there. Some folks have said they won't be here ne next time I'm preaching. Well, I, I don't think I'll, you know, unless I'm asked again uh, at some other point. I don't think we get, get to the point where Nebuchadnezzar becomes a believer. But he did in the end. And God's no man's debt to you now, friends. You can't buy his blessing. We know that, don't we? But you can put yourself in the way of his blessing by honouring him. Uh, they had put God before every other consideration, uh, and in turn, he honoured them with a favour that the unbelievers around could see. It wasn't them saying, God's blessing me. They could see that with their own eyes, just like with Joseph. Everything, everything that happened to him that was bad, <laughs> the Lord's favour was on him nevertheless, and other people saw it, and here it was with these three uh, lads. Uh, he, ter he in turn honoured them because they had honoured him with a favour that the unbelievers around could see, which made them brilliant witnesses for the Lord, which is what we want to be, isn't it? We don't want to just gather here week after week and get more and more bored. You know, we've seen it all, we've done it all. We need to be excited with the new people and the people the Lord's bringing across our pathway, with our lives being relevant for him. Well, let me wind up. I am winding up now. Tomorrow we'll be back to our everyday lives, surrounded by untold godliness and idolatry, in this world, you don't need me to talk about what kind of a world we live in. I want to ask you the question tonight. Are you prepared to stand for God amidst it all and be true to him? I wish I could say to everyone who's connected with our church. Are people going to see us stand out for him and see the favour and blessing of God upon our lives? Or is this our just another religious observance, just something else we do with this church? You know, uh, one up from the Sunday morning folks, one up from the Sunday night folks. We put in a bit of extra shifts. We come on a Thursday as well. You know, it's something we do, but uh, no more. You know, we, we want the Word of God to make an impact on us, don't we? Well, I do. Time short. We want the Word of God to make an impact on us, even if it upsets us. If it's God, friends, toughen up. Soak it up. That's what they say today, isn't it? You know, receive it. And it changes you spiritually. And it makes you strong.
So thank you so much for listening. I'm sorry, so sorry for my stuttering and stammering. It is really awful when you're up here and you can't get your flow in your, you know, of words. Folks will tell you it's terrible. But thank you for your patience. And uh, if you can just get what we try to get over and receive it is from the Lord, I'm sure that you'll find it a blessing in the days that lie ahead. So thanks for your attention tonight. And I'll get out as early as normal now, won't you?